Good morning, Valley Gate Church. Pastor Daryl here, excited to be here with you this morning as we celebrate Christ and we continue to rely upon him in this season that we find ourselves in as a nation and as a church. First and foremost, I want to make sure we give our roll call. So uh, no matter where you're at here in the valley, we want to make sure that you just go into the chat and say hello from wherever you are. And so if it's South Phoenix, if it's North Phoenix, Central Phoenix, you can be in Maricopa, you can be in Mesa, Queen Creek, uh, you can be anywhere here in the valley. We just want to make sure that you say hello. Uh, and if you're outside of the Phoenix metropolitan area, please let us know where you are tuning in. And uh, we'd love to just say hello to you as well as any of our first-time guests, if this is your first time here, please click the I'm New Here button and uh, fill out the information, and we would love to connect with you. And so we want to say thank you so much for being here with us. I'm excited about today's sermon, uh, but before we get to that, I want to make sure that I say thank you, first and foremost, for all of the people who took the time to fill out our VGC CARE survey. We wanted to make sure in this time of COVID-19 and our, us being separated from one another that we had a good sense and a good feel for uh, where you were at and how you were doing. We feel like that is essential because we believe that as God continues to allow us to care for you, it's going to give us greater opportunity to love on our community. So I want to give you just some, uh, some, some information as it associates to that survey. And first of all, it was a great response from you all. And so we're excited about that and the wonderful things that we have learned. Uh, this is going to be used so that we can continue our efforts to number one, serve you, serve our church. We care about you, and so this survey truly was designed to gauge where we as members are, how we are doing in the midst of this current pandemic, how are you doing physically and mentally, how are you doing spiritually as well. We also wanted to understand everyone's comfort level as it related to returning back to uh, church and having service here in the building. So here's some of the information uh, that we were able to find out. Number one is 70% of all of you all who responded rated your spiritual health during this current time as good or excellent. So we're very encouraged by that. 89% stated that you were confident or highly confident in how you were responding in the midst of this COVID-19 situation. 93% of you uh, reported that you are extremely likely uh, or highly likely to recommend VGC, your church, to your friends. So that just lets us know your level of excitement about what God is doing here through our church. And then 58% of you, and this is important as well as we continue to prepare to return back to service, 58% of you responded and said that you are ready to return to service. And uh, there was a percentage of that that I don't have exactly right now. Some of you all said, I'm ready to return, but I want to make sure that precautions and safety precautions are in place. So in addition to all of this, our membership is very, very positive. We had over 60 people uh, respond uh, to this and express their desire to serve during this pandemic time. So be it you serve on Sundays here or you serve outside. Uh, as we come back, we're going to have online service and we're going to have service here. And so we're just trying to figure out ways in which we can release you. Uh, we're going to be working very, very uh, hard to address some of the issues and the needs that were expressed in the surveys. There were not many, but any need that you have, they're important to us. And so in the upcoming weeks, you should expect a phone call from our members care team as they want to assist you and try to help you during this season of time. And uh, also, please make sure that you share any additional concerns that you may have, any needs that you may have during this time as we know that that changes. Our goal is to mobilize us as a church and as a team to support our church and to also support our community. And so you're going to hear more about what we talk about as it relates to VGC loves. We want to love on our community. And so we feel like if we care for and we love on you, then that will give you a great opportunity to care and love on our community. And that's what I believe God has called us here for. And so during these weeks, uh, we're going to be collecting donations. We're going to be collecting essential items for the people here in Tempe. And we want you to participate. And so ultimately, the survey was to make sure that we know how you are doing so that we we can make sure that you are well so that we can go into our communities and help others get well also. And so just give yourself a hand clap uh, because it really this helps us know how we need to serve in our community. So with that being said, are you ready for God's word? I know that I am. So we're going to join together in Nehemiah chapter 2. 
Nehemiah chapter 2, we're going to focus on verses 1 through 5. We're still in our release series, and as you can see behind me, it says release. And here on my shirt, in Greek, it says release as well. And so we're, we're, we're believing God that he is going to release us into the purpose that he has in store for our life. Long ago, we talked about that there are things that seem to have us tied up, but God in this season of time is about to release us, and he is releasing us into the very purpose by which he created us for. And so today, we're going to speak about what does it mean to be released to be a deliverer. Everybody say deliverer. If you really want to look at that word up, it means someone who will help uh, help someone. It's a helper. It's someone who will help release someone, someone who is bound up. They need someone to help them be released. And so we believe, and I believe in my heart, that God has called each and every one of us to be a deliverer. So let's join together in Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 and 5. And it came to pass in the, mo- in the month of Nisan... In the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and I gave it to the king. Now, I had never been sad in the presence of the king before. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. So I became dreadfully afraid. And I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lie waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, what do you request? So I prayed to heaven and I need to find this. I actually put this down at the bottom. So so I prayed to heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, And if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me. Everybody say, send me. I ask that you send me to Judah, the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Father, we pray that you would bless us as we study your word. We're grateful that this is our season of release. God, I pray that each person here under the sound of my voice, whether they be sitting in their home, sitting in their family room, if they are propped up before their phone. Father, I pray right now that we will stop ourselves, that we will still in this moment so that we can really prepare ourselves to receive from you your word that gives life, but also your word that delivers. God, you are going to minister to our very spirit, and I pray that we will receive it in kind and that you would allow us to see that what lies inside of me is a man and a woman of purpose who has been called to be a deliverer for the kingdom. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You know, when you think about that word deliver, you see quite often that there were a number of people in the Bible who could actually be associated with the concept of being a deliverer, one who would help, one who would help someone be set free, one who would go grab people out of captivity, one who would allow those who were broken and wounded to be made well. You can see even the book of Judges, I believe it's 317, that God actually raised up what we call a deliverer, someone who would come and who would gather his people and deliver them from their enemies. We see that God would even call Moses to deliver his people. We see that God would cause a man, Joshua, to deliver the children of Israel from the place of bondage so that they could cross over the Jordan and go into their promised land. We see that even in the New Testament that God would use some of his disciples, Jesus would use some of his disciples to come and to deliver people from strongholds and issues that were in their life. And obviously we see that ultimately Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, the King is the ultimate deliverer. He was the one who would come and who would die a dreadful death so that we could live an amazing life because he delivered us from sin and he delivered us from brokenness. And, and, and quite often many of us, we accept The reality that someone can be our deliverer, but some of us don't think that God has called us to be deliverers. And I believe, as I surmise this, that if we think about God's purpose and God's plan for our life, anything that God has purposed you for has to have something related to his deliverance entailed in it. Anything that God has called you to. 
I don't care if God has called you to be the best business person, business person in the world. I don't care if God has called you to be the best musician or creative person in the world. I don't care if God has called you to be the best linguist, communicator, whatever it is. Every gift that God has given you, he has given you so that you can be a source of deliverance for someone else. And I believe that. We talked about purpose last week. We talked about this very man, Nehemiah, as he was thrust into purpose, whether he wanted to or not. He was the one who recognized that there were people who were in dire need. And in the midst of that, he found that in the midst of their pain, he found his purpose. And that purpose would be something that, yes, it was thrust out of pain, but it caused him to pray. And he recognized that this was personal for his own life. And because it was personal for his own life, he recognized that anything that God was going to do through it, he would prosper, but others would as well. And so we celebrate God's purpose for our life. But let me tell you something. Then God begins to be clear on his purpose for your life. And I believe as we look at the life of Nehemiah, as we move through this narrative and we see this story unfold, God's purpose for Nehemiah is that Nehemiah will be a man of purpose and a man of purpose will be expressed through him helping deliver his people. And God's purpose for your life, whether you recognize it or not, is that God has called you to be a man and a woman of purpose, a mother and a father of purpose, a sister and a friend of purpose, a neighbor of purpose. And that the reason why God has called you into this situation and put you around people is so that you would understand that your purpose of being here on this earth is so that you could help be a deliverer for someone who is in your midst as well. See, purpose is not just about you, as I said. Purpose is about him. And when it's about him, it's always about them. See, Jesus, when he came, he never came to seek and save just one. He came to seek and save everyone that he possibly could so that they could experience deliverance and freedom. And if we're going to experience deliverance and freedom, the same Jesus that delivered us and set us free has now given us the power and the authority so that we can help deliver and help other people get set free as well. If you believe that, will you... Would you type in amen? Because I believe this is for us today. I believe that as we talked about God's purpose and we talked about us hitting the mark, I believe that God is touching on something today in each and every one of us. We can, we can do a lot of things in this world. We can experience a lot of joys in this world. But what we have to experience is that God has allowed us to be the source of deliverance for someone else. And we see that that's exactly what is happening here. We see that now Nehemiah, after he realizes that his people are in Jerusalem and they are of reproach and they are vulnerable and they are weak and they are subject to attack, now he has to be the one who recognizes if nobody else is going to do it, I guess it's going to be me. So you know I have statements for you and I want to give these to you. And I don't want you to forget these. One focuses on last week as it relates to purpose, and the other two talk about now how we transition to purpose, to God really defining the very task that he's called us to. When God reveals his purpose to you, it's for a purpose. When God reveals his purpose to you, It's for a purpose. God never shows you something that he doesn't believe. He doesn't give you the opportunity to respond to. So when he shows you his purpose, it's for a purpose. And I believe this in my heart with everything in my spirit. I believe that God is going to raise up deliverers in his church. And I'll say this in this church. God is going to raise up deliverers in his church to include Valley Gate Church. And some of the most unprecedented and dire times, God will call you to be his deliverer. And some of the most unprecedented and dire times, we might be looking around wondering who, and God is looking squarely in your neighborhood, in your house, on that couch, in the seat that you are sitting in and you're asking who and God today says you, you, it's you, it's you. And I believe this is how we know. When God releases us to be deliverers, he gives us three things. Number one, he gives us a burden in our heart. He will give you a burden in your heart. 
Let's look at this, a burden. See, a burden is something that it, 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 you can't shake it. A burden is something that you can't avoid it. A burden is something that you can't outweigh. It's something that seems to stick with you and, and you can't let it go and it begins to weigh on you. God is going to begin to place a burden inside of you and a burden not on you, but a burden inside of you because God wants to move and he's in the, he's in, he's in the business of delivering. And what he needs is if he's in the business of delivering, he needs somebody who carries it as a burden. See, what's your burden in life? See, what is the thing that as much as you try to do all of these other things and, and as much as you experience success in this area and as much as people lot over you about what you can do and all of your gifts, there's a burden inside of you that if you don't do this, it won't be right. See, God will put a burden in your heart. Here's what he says. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you are not sick? The king acknowledged this. This is nothing more than sorrow of heart. And I became dreadfully afraid. And, and I said to the king, my king, live forever. But why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, it lies in waste and the gates are burned with fire? See, when, when Nehemiah answered that, what the king could see that was really in this man's heart and in his spirit, the king now understood the source of his burden. See, it's, see when you have a burden, there's a source that comes with your burden. And, if, and, and I want to ask you this, what was the source of Nehemiah's burden? If you look, what do you think the source of Nehemiah's burden was? And you can type this in. What do you think the source of Nehemiah's burden was? It wasn't that Nehemiah wanted to get rich. It wasn't that Nehemiah wanted to retire. It wasn't that Nehemiah wanted to get a check on whatever his social media platform was. It wasn't that Nehemiah wanted anything else. But Nehemiah was burdened because he was burdened because his people were in a desperate state in Jerusalem and his ancestors' homes were being destroyed. See, the source of his burden had more to do with the people who he loved than it was about the things that he could enjoy. And there was a sign of his burden as well. It was noticeable. Even if he tried to hide it, you couldn't get rid of it. The king, because he noticed it, he noticed it. He could not settle down. He could not hide this. He could not put this undercover. He was so moved by this that the very burden that he had was a sign to everyone else that there is something brewing in this man's spirit. And that there's timing of the burden. There's the timing of the burden. See, when you have a burden that is in your heart, there is time. And everybody say timing. Because a lot of us, when we have a burden, we jump up and we run and we go do something without really thinking about it. But remember what we read in, 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 uh, in Nehemiah chapter 1. It says that when this came upon Nehemiah, it says day and night he wept, he prayed, and he fasted. I want us to do a little bit of math here so you can understand this. Now, when we first met Nehemiah in chapter 1, the month was called Kislev. Everybody say Kislev. Kislev. Kislev, we believe, was somewhere in between November and December. And then we see now when he encounters the king, now this is the month of Nisan. Everybody say Nisan. See, when things happen, it doesn't mean that you jump up and you go try to fix something if you are not prepared. And the only way that you can be prepared is if you are in the right timing of God. The only way that you can really do something that is going to make a difference is if you are in the will of God, but also you are in the timing of God. And a lot of people do something because they know it is the will of God, but they do it outside of the timing of God. And everybody wants to jump up when things go on. And everybody wants to say, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do that. But when have you spent time with God? And when have you prayed? And when have you waited on God? Nehemiah had this burden for four months where he could not eat. He wept and he had to pray. He had to wait on God. And sometimes we have to wait before we move. You need to hear that. Sometimes you have to wait before you move. Because in Nisan, now that month is March or April. So before Nehemiah could do anything, he had to wait on God's timing. Four months had gone by, and all he could do was pray. Four months had gone by, and all he could do was wait on God. Four months had gone by, and all he could do was fast. And see, we live in a culture where everybody wants to try to do something right now, 
But sometimes your right now is not right in the will of God. And we want to be in the will of God. And when the source of your burden is identified, then the source of God's timing should be as well. It says that he waited for four months. And then God opened up the door for the right time. Everybody hear me? Everybody say right time. Because when God gives you a burden, your burden may not be, it it may not be something that you can do right now. But when God gives you a burden, he's going to also give you the right time. He gave him the right time. Four months, four months, and then he was ready to go. And I believe that God is placing burdens in our heart. And I believe that God is placing something inside of us that others can see that that's on her. That's in him. And God is placing that burden inside of you so that you can understand the source of where it comes from. And if the source has anything to do with God and his people, you keep going. Because you're going to see signs of this burden over and over again harassing you and not letting you go. And then you have to trust in God's timing. See, you may have to carry this burden long enough until you have fasted and prayed. Hear me on this. You may very well have to carry this burden long enough until you have fasted and prayed. Because when you fast and pray... I believe that's when God begins to speak to you, give you clarity of focus and vision and execution so that you can do what he called you to do in this time. It's a burden, and it's in your heart. Point number two, when you recognize that God has called you to be a deliverer, he will grant you boldness beyond you. Everybody say boldness. See, boldness is one of these things that everybody wants to have, but in, in all reality, it's not something that we really do. Because boldness that is truly expressed means that it is a situation that you will find yourself in circumstances that are unideal, they are not comfortable, and you definitely would not prefer them. It means that fear is present. It means that you are not certain. That means that you are insecure. You may not be confident about it. You may find so many things about you or about what's going on that will cause you to think that you cannot do it. But when God gives you a burden, he's going to grant you boldness if it's beyond you. See, you have to have some boldness that be beyond you. See, in anything that God calls you to, I always say this, you know that it's God calling you because it's bigger than you. And anything that God calls you to that is bigger than you, it means that it's, you're going to have, some, have to have some boldness that is beyond you. You're going to have to be led by God's spirit more than you're led by your feelings. You're going to have to trust in God's word more than trust in what you see. You're going to have to believe that God can do it even though you see no opportunity of availing in and of yourself. You're going to have to step in the, in the ring with some giants even though you feel small like a grasshopper. But you have to step in and all you have to step into in each one of those situations is not your boldness, but a boldness that is beyond you. And if it's a boldness that is beyond you, then it means it's a boldness that has been birthed by God. See, you have to have boldness that is beyond you. And I'm telling you, I don't want to live with people who want to live in comfort. I don't want to live with people who want to live in what seems right. I don't want to live with people who are safe in the status quo. I want to live with people who are willing to step out into the beyond because they are trusting God and having faith in him. Because boldness will push you on what you feel comfortable with. Boldness will push you into the ring of your giants. Boldness will put you into the ring where there are lions, tigers, and bears. Boldness will make you get a sling and a stone and make you fight for whatever it is that is yours. Boldness will make you hang up on a cross and die and separate yourself from sin because he is the one who grants you boldness. Boldness has to be on you. It can't just be something that you think you have. God wants to grant us boldness. Three through five, it says, and he said to the king, he said to the king, my king, live forever. Matter of fact, we, we, let's, just, let's go back to this. He says, I was dread, so I was dread, dreadfully af- afraid in verse 2. See, I was dreadfully afraid. So before I even say what I said to the king, I want you to understand my heart. I was dreadfully afraid. And then I said to the king, my king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad and when the city, the place of my father's tombs, it lies in waste and its gates are burned with fire. Then the king said to me, what do you request? And I love what Nehemiah does. And I believe this is one of the reasons why he could be bold. 
He said, so I what? Before he answered, what did he do? So I prayed to the God of heaven. See, he didn't, he didn't go pull his list out. He prayed to the God of heaven. And the reason why you can be bold is you know that whatever you are asking, it lines up with the will of the Father. So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, and we'll stop right there. See, you want to know why he had to be bold? Do you understand that when you worked for the king and you were part of the royal court, it was actually punishable by prison for you to show up with a sad face before the king? You could be punished for showing a downtrodden emotion. See, when he understood this, that the dread that was in his heart is because he knew that should he have shown anything to the king that was outside of what he was supposed to, it's either going to go one way or another. And, and, and boldness should make you feel like that. See, boldness should make you step up in there and be like, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I know if it works out wrong, I'm going to end up over here. But if I know that this is the will of God, God is going to change something. And see, boldness was the thing that made him do it. He had to wait for the opportune time, for the right moment. He had to taste the king's uh, wine, and he had to make sure that he was before the king, and he did it on purpose. He showed his emotions on purpose, because boldness is not something that you just do by accident. you got to walk in the boldness of God on purpose. And he, dis he displayed his boldness by actually showing his emotions. See, that was punishable. That was punishable by prison. And so when the king noticed it, this is when he knew he was in the will of God because the king said this, what do you request? Now listen to what he says. If it pleases the king and your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah. See, there are two parts of this boldness. Number one is that you may be dreadfully afraid, but number two, Boldness makes you courageously pursue. See, you might be afraid, but what prompts you to keep going is something inside of you, that burden that will not let you stop. He faced his fear, but he was led by courage. And in the midst of where you find yourself, whenever there's fear present, I pray that courage is as well. See, when you're a deliverer, God has called you to courageously pursue. Not passively, not haphazardly, not easily, but courageously. I believe that God is raising up people with a courage from heaven that will allow us to extend beyond even the dreams that we have for our own selves. Because when he gives you a burden in your heart, boldness will move you beyond what you think you can do. Even, hear me on this, even if you're afraid, if God has called you to do it, he will give you the boldness and the courage that is beyond you to pursue it. You may be dreadfully afraid, but courageously pursue. Because God is trying to move you beyond where you're at so they can move you into the place where he created you to be. And it is going to take courage, and it is gonna take boldness, and it is gonna take a burden for you to do what God has called you to do. Finally, deliverers, they have a burden to be used. To be used. When we, when we came here, I began to do some research about Arizona. And I wanted to know the spiritual climate. I wanted to know how people thought here. And I wanted to understand clearly what, who, who are the people that we are going to be serving. And I will never forget what I actually um, found out. I found out that the Phoenix metropolitan area per square mile has more shopping centers and plazas than anywhere else in the United States. 
And what it helped me understand is this, is that a lot of people here are consumers. A lot of people here, what they do is they go to places where they can find that is a benefit to them and, and they look for things that they can gain. They're consumers, they're purchasers, and they want to receive and they want to get. But what God is telling us is I'm looking for people who have a burden to be used. I want to make sure that I can use you. And Nehemiah understood that as well. And so we look in verse 5a and it says this, he says, And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask you to send who? Send me. Send me to my father's city and my father's tombs that I may rebuild it. See, he just didn't want to be sent, but he understood that if he was going to be sent, God was going to use him to do something. And see, when you have a burden, you don't feel comfortable unless God is using you. See, when you have a burden, it's not just good enough to consume, but you have to be used. See, when you have a burden, even what we're talking about in our nation and in our world right now, everybody wants change. But my question is, is who has a burden strong enough to be the change? Everybody wants to see somebody else changing, and everybody needs to change. Each and every one of us, as we notice within our world today, and our nation today, each and every one of us, we need to change. But are you bold enough, and do you have a burden enough that you will be the one who will change? Because Nehemiah said, don't send anybody else. I know I got this cushy job over here, and I know that the king loves me, and I know I'm a part of the royal court, but there's a burden inside of me that says, I will leave all of that. I will leave all of that to be used by you. What is God using you for? And how is God using you to be a deliverer? How is he using you? Nehemiah says was very clear. He was supposed to be the one who would go back and he would be used to rebuild. He would be the one who would be used to bring about change. He would be the one who would go back and for his people, he would be, through the grace of God, a deliverer. You know, when I think about everything that I have privilege of doing, and I think about my life, I think one of the joys that I have is to help people get free. I think about the things in my life that used to tie me up and used to bind me. I, I think about the places in my life where I, I was very casual and status quo. I think about the places in my life where I simply allowed my disobedience to uh, overcome my obedience. And, and, and I recognize that those are some things that God wanted changed in me. And I'm grateful because he began to surround me with people who I call my modern day deliverers. He began to surround me with people who began to encourage my soul and look into my very soul and who would not just look at me haphazardly and say hello and keep going, but really wanted to know what is going on in my soul. They loved me enough to correct me. They loved me enough to help me because they understood that if they were called by God to help me become what I was supposed to be, I was a rehab project. I was a rehab project. See, in Washington, D.C., they have a lot of these homes now, and, and they're doing all this gentrification. And what you see is you see these homes that were built in the early 1900s and the late 1800s, and they're old on the outside. But when you walk inside and you look, you realize, oh, my goodness, somebody has come, and they've done a rehabilitation project here. And when you walk in, you see, oh, my goodness, they've rebuilt this thing on the inside. And I believe that that's what God wants us to recognize is that he's calling us to build and to rebuild. See, you've been walking with people for the last 20 years and you know that on the outside they look okay, but you can tell because you walk with them long enough that on the inside something is dying. And you've not once asked them, is there anything going on inside of your soul? 
See, you've prayed with people. You've laughed and, 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 and you've spent time with them. You've read Bible studies with them, but you've never asked them what's going on in your soul. Is there anything in your soul that God is trying to rebuild? See, you've lived with friends and you never asked once, how are you doing? How are you living? What is God doing inside of your soul so that we can make sure that he's rebuilding what needs to be revealed, rebuilt? And God is calling us in this season of time as deliverers to make sure that we are willing to let go of anything else and go to the place of those who we love and care for the most so that we can help them and their lives be rebuilt. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the people who had part in helping rebuild my life. I'm grateful for the people who had part in helping my life be changed. See, because Another question, what's that dilapidated thing in your life that God is calling you to rebuild? What is that thing? Because I believe as we can begin to identify that thing, God has a deliverer waiting for you. I'll end it with this. I got a phone call from a friend of mine who I care deeply for. And we've lost contact and uh, he's gone on about his life and doing things and I've gone on about my life and periodically we'll think about one another and we'll text each other and we'll give our pleasantries and we'll say hello but this time I got a phone call and I could tell that there was something a little bit different and so we decided to meet and we met at 5.30 in the morning this person is someone who uh, is known throughout the community, but this person found himself challenged. And as we sat, I could see the brokenness in his life. And because he trusted me, he shared with me his brokenness. And I began to pray. And God just began to impress upon my heart to make sure that I prayed for this man and to remind him that God would set him free. God will set him free. And we got up and we finished our drink and he went his way and I went mine. Seven o'clock this morning, I get a, a text message and say, can I just call you? I have two things I want to just mention to you, of course. And that same man said, I didn't tell you the whole story. I didn't tell you everything that I found myself going through. And I participated in some things that really could have put me in a bad situation. He said, but when you begin to pray for me and you begin to pray for that thing about me being free, I felt it in my body, something being released. And I wanna tell you this because I know you're supposed to do this because this is your job. And I know you're supposed to do this and you might do this because you care for me. But I want to let you know this, that when you prayed for me, when you prayed for me, God healed something inside of me. And I believe that that's what God wants to do in each and every one of us. And in order for us to be deliverers, there's got to be a burden inside of you. There's got to be something that moves beyond you. And there's got to be a burden where you can say, God, I want to be used by you. And should you do it, we'll learn that there are so many other aspects of what he'll use in you to be the source of healing, freedom, and deliverance in others. And I want to ask you this as I summarize. It's two people. It's two people. Some of you all, you need to be delivered today. You've been wrestling with the same thing over and again. It just demonstrates itself in different ways, different hues, different colors, but it's the same thing. Some of you have not changed, and that change that you've desired, that change has not come. And I believe God wants you to be delivered today. I want to pray for you. And after I pray for you, then I want to pray for those others who you recognize 
that God has called you to be the source of delivery, delivers for someone else. But for those who you recognize, I need that. I need to be set free. There are some things that bind me up. I'm like the children of Israel. I'm vulnerable. Every wall of protection that I've set up in my life, it's burned down. Everything that I had by way of security, you know what, it's destroyed. And I need deliverance. I need a deliverer. If that's you, wherever you're at, just close your eyes and allow me to pray. I want you to lift your hands wherever you're at. Because one of the first true signs of freedom in many ways with Christ is surrender. And I want you to lift your hands as I pray for you. Dear God, I thank you for my brother and sister. God, I thank you that today is their day of deliverance. God, I thank you for the chains and the things that have held them captive. They're no longer going to hold you captive anymore. The places in their weakness and where they've been vulnerable, where they continue to fall, God, we pray that you will deliver them from them all. God, the source of that thing that continues to haunt them, harass them, we rebuke it in the name of Jesus Christ. We declare the power of your Holy Spirit to move in and through your people right now. And we declare, you are delivered. If you believe that, just keep your hands lifted. You take a deep breath and you just let it go. Let everything go. In the name of Jesus Christ, we release it. And then there are some others. You're good Christians. You're good Christians. People love you. And God continues to bring people around you. And some you've just missed, you've overlooked. Because you didn't understand that your purpose was to be a deliverer. You thought your purpose was just to be a good Christian, a nice person. But there are some people who continually walk by you that you can tell something's not right. And it's not going to be right until you help them get it right. Some of you all, it's, 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 it's even those who are closest to you. It's family members. It's the ones that you struggle with the most are the ones who need the most deliverance. And God says it's not going to happen until you accept the purpose that I've called you to. Could it be that the reason why they continue to be in the bondage that they are in is because you've not accepted the burden that God has given you, the burden to be a deliverer? And today, I want to take off all of these little spiritual deals. I want to take off all of these little things. Yes, you go to church, and yes, you go to the Bible study, and yes, you go to small group, release all of that. But today, God says, it's you. It's you. I'm calling you for my purpose. I'm calling you to be the person of deliverance for someone. And today, God says, I call it out of you. And if that's you, I want you to receive this prayer. Close your eyes. Dear God, I thank you. I thank you for the deliverer that you've placed inside of my brother and my sister. I pray, God, that you would grant them boldness to be about your business. I pray that through you, they would say, here I am, God, send me. Here I am, not anybody else. My marriage might be messed up. It's not about him. My marriage might be messed up. It's not about her. But God, here I am. Send me. I might be struggling with addiction. It's not about my past anymore. I might be caught up in some lustful behavior. It's not about what somebody else did. But here I am. Send me. 
I might be stuck in a rut. It's not about the last person who disappointed me or the last failure that I experienced. But here I am. Send me. And lastly, and these are the scariest ones, I might be okay as a Christian. I might go to church. I might sing on the choir. I might usher. I might serve. I might sing. I might preach. I might do all of that. But God, here I am. Send me. Because a requisite response of a deliverer is simply this. Send me. Father, we release that in the name of Jesus Christ. And we pray that you would send us. If that's you, I want you to type and I want you to say, send me. I want you to be bold. Hear me. I want you to be bold. I want you to step outside of yourself and I want you to type so that the world will know, send me. Send me, God. If you can send no one else, send me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want us to give God a hand clap of praise. I want us to thank him for who he is and what he does. And I just want to say, God, thank you. Thank you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. (coughs) Now, if there's anybody here who you recognize, you you don't have a relationship with Christ. Maybe (coughs) I've talked about all of the things that God wants to do to use you first thing we need to do is surrender our life to him. And if there's anybody here who you recognize that if I want to be used by God, I have to first surrender my life so I can be a vessel for him. That's what we call salvation. That's what we say surrender is. And And I want to give you this opportunity. I know I'm going a little bit longer but I want to give you this opportunity because in the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about all of this racial reconciliation stuff. We're going to talk about all of that. But if we're not right with God, why do you expect for somebody else to get right with God to make you feel good about yourself? And we have to begin to ask God first, get me right, Jesus, get me right. I want to be right with you. And it starts with salvation. It starts with salvation. And so, If there's anybody here who you recognize you don't have a relationship with Christ, but you want one, I want to pray for you. There's a little box that'll come up and you can click raise your hand. And once you raise your hand, you're going to receive a link that says connect with us. That link is going to take you to a form where you can fill out information and we're going to make sure that we have resources available to you. But it comes down to this before you can ever, ever desire to be used by God. You need to surrender all of who you are to him. So today, for some, this is your day of surrender. And if that's you, click that button and just say, raise your hand, let me pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you, God, for the opportunity that you give us to respond to you. And I pray that your word has done just that. It has caused us to respond for those people who recognize that while I do know the tradition of religion, I don't have the relationship that comes with my religion. That's a relationship of complete surrender to my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. But today, I choose with all of my being and all of who I am to say, Lord, I want to follow you. I'll turn away and I'll follow you. Lord, for each person who acknowledges that in their heart, we ask that you would cover them, you would keep them, you protect them, you'd restore them. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say, Amen.